G'day, Dylan O'Donnell again, uh, back for a video about the Rasa, which I promised you. I should start by saying I don't know if it's pronounced Rasa or Rasa. Uh, it stands for Ro Ackerman Schmidt Astograph, so I suspect the correct pronunciation would be Rasa. Uh, but I'm Australian and it just feels natural to say Rasa. Uh, it sounds a bit posh, doesn't it? Now, a bit of a disclaimer, I am on Team Celestron. I'm a huge Rasa fan and just Celestron products generally. I use Celestron most of the time. I did get this at a pretty steep discount because it was a early model refurb. So I got it straight from the Torrance factory after it was refurbished. But still, it's an amazing telescope. And I'm saying that honestly, I will go through the critiques I have of it and things you should know before you get one. But hopefully this video will help, particularly if you are looking at getting one or you're just curious about what this new kind of telescope is all about. This is the 11 inch Rasa. There is a 14 inch Rasa mentioned in the white paper. Those aren't really available to the public just yet, but I do know that there are observatories using those. Whether they will be released to the public remains to be seen. If they are, it would be a terrific focal length and it would be around the 780 millimeter focal length, which is pretty good. For a wide field telescope, that's uh, quite a tight target. Orion Nebula would be basically filling the entire frame uh, and in excellent detail. And I worked that out using the Vintel calculator, uh, which is actually something I developed. Uh, so if you're interested in working out all that sort of stuff and getting previews of your targets and focal lengths and that sort of thing, whether you use a camera or eyepiece, uh, that is on their website. And really, a 14-inch F2 Rasa would be a galaxy hunter. That kind of light collecting potential would be amazing. So what is it? It's a wide field telescope. Normally when you see a big telescope, you think high magnification but this is not a high magnification telescope. This does not zoom in really close to distant objects. It's not your ideal telescope for things like planets, for example. In fact, it's unworkable for, for planets. However, what it lacks in magnification, it makes up in just a pure photon collection. Uh, we're talking F2.2, which is amazingly fast. Now, if you're not familiar with how f-stops work, uh, typically a schmidt cassegrain telescope is f10 so it's quite slow it's fine for bright things like planets and it's high magnification so it's good for planets but f-stop is not linear something that you image at f10 doesn't take half as much exposure at f5 so something that you image at f2 takes something like 30 times less exposure than it would at f10 so it's a huge increment imaging at f2.2 is ridiculously fast stuff that was really faint um, things like the horsehead or the rosette nebula uh, suddenly are able to be imaged within 30 seconds even and quite deep imaging so you see a lot of nebulosity and a lot of detail so what do you get let's have a look at the rasa itself when you buy a rasa which is a very expensive telescope they started retailing at ten thousand dollars here so it's not a small investment it's a big investment in a telescope what do you get? Basically just this, just the OTA. So let's go through it. So you've probably seen this setup before with Hyperstar or Faster. The imaging happens at the top end of the telescope, which is counterintuitive, right? The light's coming in here and you're putting a big obstruction up the front. But this is how the Schmidt ast uh, astrograph works. The light comes in, it's bounced off the plate mirror at the back and then back up to this focal point uh, right here where the camera is. Now historically the Schmidt Ast or the Schmidt camera or the Schmidt telescopes that we used in observatories the focus point was back here in the telescope so they actually put the camera inside the telescope uh, which as you can imagine is not not easy to do and certainly not not a good setup for a consumer so this design corrected for all this to get the focus point right up here. Now we can put a camera at the front. Now when Fastar was first released, cameras were still pretty big. So in a sense, it was a bit ahead of its time. Now cameras are getting smaller and their footprints are getting as such where we can put them up the front here. But let's have a look at how this is set up. 
So there's my QHY9 that I've just taken off. And you'll see here I have one spacer just to get the correct focus point and I have the filter draw system. Now this filter draw system is actually from the Hyperstar. So this is something that I found very useful when using Hyperstar and it's still very useful with the Rasa. If you have one of these or you are going to do narrowband imaging, I definitely recommend it. And of course this attaches onto the two inch thread for your cameras. They also provide another adapter. So you can put on a one, two, five, uh, adapter and screw on a smaller camera there if you want. By the way this filter drawer is magnetic so they just sort of clip in which is fantastic. Now obviously when you have an obstruction at the front of the telescope like this you'll have cables running out as well. So depending on how you want your diffraction spikes and you can have slight diffraction spikes you can position your cables running out at 90 degree angles like this, so you get the four pointed stars. But generally, diffraction spikes are very minimal, which I, I like. I don't, uh, I don't think it's great to have diffraction spikes all over your images. They look pretty cool for clusters and things though. You'll see at the back here, we've got the typical lock screws and focus knob. Now the focus on this one, because it is that uh, older early model refurb that I got, this isn't the focuser you would get. You would get a feather touch style focuser, but this is a stock 11 inch SET focuser. Now this thing in the middle here, that's a fan. You can see my uh, my RAS is getting bombarded with sun at the minute. This tube gets pretty hot, that's going to affect your focus. So this fan here extracts air and pulls it down to the ambient te temperature a lot quicker. So let's try and give you this little dicky 12 volt battery pack for using AA batteries uh, to plug in there. I've always wondered why Celestron puts in cheap or no power adapters at all. Um, they make such great stuff. You've paid $10,000 for a telescope you think they could throw in a bit of power for you. Um, just a regular power adapter would be great or a cigarette lighter or something to, uh, to actually be usable in the field. This is really quirky. So I'm just using a regular power adapter, 12 volt, 2 amps on this one, and that gets the fan going. And that actually works pretty well, I found at night. I had to close the dome because it's just so windy and sunny out there, I didn't want to get this too hot. So how does it actually perform? I have to say this thing has really upped the game in terms of my imaging. Now you, you may know that I've been a Hyperstar fan for a while and I've used Hyperstar effectively for ages. Uh, there is another a video on the Astro Imaging channel where I deep dive into Hyperstar technology and this technology is essentially very similar it's almost exactly the same it's just that they've built Hyperstar essentially into one OTA into, into one telescope so that you don't have to use an extra adapter you don't have to screw things on and off you don't have to play with the flatness of the field and the collimation you can collimate this but it's really fiddly with some Allen screws uh, if you are, if you do have an authorised vendor who can look after that for you, I would trust it to them. I'm, I'm not game to get up there with an Allen key so close to the front of the telescope and risk scratching the glass or anything like that. I'm definitely not confident in my own abilities doing that. But thankfully, once it's collimated, it's actually pretty solid. You really don't need to touch that. Uh, so don't, don't muck around with that stuff if you can help it. Because you're putting everything at the front of the telescope, you are going to lose the ability to put on big things such as motorised filter wheels and focuses and things like that. So um, get used to doing things a little bit more manual like using that filter draw system to swap out the filters. That said, you're imaging so quickly and you can knock over images so quickly, it's not that big of a deal. It's not like you're automating everything to the point where you need to leave it running overnight then come back the next day. Uh, you can swap filters, go have a cup of tea, come back and do the next filter. It's not that long. One thing I noticed immediately was it was a lot more difficult to focus than I realised. The critical focus zone is very, very small and because the exposures that you take are pulling in the photon so quickly, you do see the halo of the, the plate at the back. So you will get this round fringe around your stars 
and be aware of that as you're focusing because I do think it trips up the HFR reading on your focus routine. So make sure your focus exposures are really, really low and try and, try and choose some really faint stars because they do, things blow out really quickly on this thing. It's great for nebulosity, but bright stars will be surrounded with a big halo. And that can be a problem for um, stars like Allantac in a horsehead nebula. They will have a big plate around them. The field of view on the 11 inch is 620 millimeters thereabouts, which is actually pretty good for a lot of those big targets. I'll show you some example images. So if you're thinking about buying a scope like this, there are a couple of things to bear in mind. You cannot use this telescope for visual. You, there is nowhere for an eyepiece to go. Uh, and that's fine. This is designed for photographers. It has a flat field for photography. It's designed to, to push those photons straight onto a flat plane on the chip, on the camera chip, and have as true as possible stars right to the corners of the frame. Celestron list this particular setup, which is the 11 inch Rasa and the CGX mount, as their ideal imaging setup. And I have to agree, it's actually really, really forgiving. Um, you can come away with a really deep exposure after only two hours imaging. Uh, for example, this is a two hour mosaic. So I've spent basically 30 minutes on each panel and I've done that twice, once for hydrogen alpha run and another one for the colour run. So two hours to, to pull out an image like that is super, super fast, uh, especially when you uh, are pressed for time, you're at a dark sky site or um, even an observatory like mine and you just want to knock over something very quickly before it disappears out of view. Uh, you can have a full image done in one night, a fully spectacular image. So obviously the potential for aesthetic imaging is good. I have actually connected a ZWO camera to the front of it and when you stick it into a bright target like Orion or something like that, you are essentially looking at a video. The potential for the RASA being used for video astronomy is excellent. Um, as things get better with cameras and as the pixels get smaller and more sensitive despite their size and the quantum efficiency improves, uh, this sort of telescope will just get better and better. So in a sense it's a little bit ahead of its time still. We need cameras that are smaller, have a smaller footprint so they aren't blocking too much light at the front. And then a telescope like this in various different sizes will be a fantastic addition for any astrophotographer. The other use I really should discuss is the potential for sky surveys. We know that the 14 inch RASA is something that observatories would be really, really happy to use. When you're doing astrometry and you're looking for asteroids or near-Earth objects, comets, that sort of thing, you want to cover a wide chunk of the sky quickly and you want to take exposures that are deep enough where you can identify faint objects but preferably without those objects streaking. So if you're doing a long exposure on an asteroid it's going to turn into a line. Um, but if you can pick up rapid exposures and do large swathes of the sky, uh, this is a perfect sky survey tool. I know that the hyperstars and the rises are already very popular with backyard uh, comet hunters and people who work with the Minor Planetary Center to identify asteroids and things like that. And professional observatories who often don't have a lot of resources, uh, a $10,000 telescope with this kind of potential isn't actually that expensive. Um, that's actually a very good deal. The fact that it's in consumer hands at the minute I think is remarkable. I can actually show you a asteroid I discovered in one of my old RASA image runs just the other day. astrometry to figure out what that asteroid was and you can see it, the asteroid is very clearly resolved and round um, 
So that's a new, a new. Um, I might do a video on that. That's a new field of astronomy I'd, I'd like to get into a bit more. Uh, one other thing I should talk about again is the obstruction at the front. You obviously want a small camera with a small footprint. But the other thing is, this is the 11 inch dew shield and obviously it makes things very large. It's a very impressive looking telescope. I can tell you, it looks massive. But before I got an actual 11 inch dew shield, I fashioned one up myself using some felt and I've got to be honest, it was not a good idea. Um, it just, it's not, it doesn't hold its circular shape well enough and if you do that, your stars become misshapen. I can put an example of that here. So that's about it. Hopefully I've gone over everything I meant to. Uh, for those who are interested, you really should download the white paper. It's on the Celestron website under the 11 inch Rasa product page. It's a uh, it's a big document, but it goes through the history of the telescope as well as the actual specs, focal lengths. Um, it's a really, it's actually a page turner. It's a really good read, uh, maybe for a nerd like you and me. So that's it. Thanks guys. I hope I covered everything. If I didn't, please leave a comment. And if you've got any other ideas for videos, please let me know. All right, bye-bye.